This story, which happened in 2012, shook all of Australia. A young girl disappeared from the well-lit streets of Melbourne, returning home late at night. A few days later, tens of thousands of people took to the streets to learn the shocking truth. In this video we will tell you what happened to Jill Marr and how it affected the entire Australian society. Jill Marr was born on October 30, 1982, in the small Irish port town of Drogheda. She spent her entire childhood with her parents in the village of Termenfecken, which was not far from the city. When the girl was nine years old, her father George McEwen got a job in Perth, Australia. She graduated from high school there, and in 1996 she returned to Ireland with her family. After returning home, Jill attended Druid Grammar School and St. Oliver's Community College before earning a Bachelor of Arts from University College Dublin. After successfully graduating from university, Marr got a job at a major broadcasting company. At the same time, she met Tom Marr, whom she married in 2008. A year later she and her husband decided to move to Melbourne, Australia. There, the woman took a job as a radio administrator, and sometimes she also appeared on the air. At this time, the girl's parents moved back to Perth. Jill had a great relationship with her family, and in September 2012, she went to visit them to visit her father who was ill. Jill planned to continue working the job she loved, and in a couple of years, together with her husband, they dreamed of having a child. On the evening of September 21, 2012, Jill and her co-workers went to the local Brunswick Green Bar, which was on Cindy Row, after which the company went outside for a walk. Fifteen minutes later they decided to go to another bar on the same street. Jill left the bar around 1.30 a.m. and headed home, where her husband Tom was waiting for her, on the way she called her brother Michael to discuss her father's health, who was ill. Jill voiced her concerns, and her brother made the decision to gather as a family for the coming holidays. At 2 a.m. Tom woke up and realized that Jill was still not home, he got worried and started calling her on her cell phone, but she wouldn't pick up so by 4 a.m. he decided to call the police. The police drove around the neighborhood, asking random passers-by, but to no avail, no one had seen Jill. Her co-workers, with whom she was out that night, told police that the last time they saw her was when they left a bar on Cindy Row, where they said goodbye to her and assumed she would be home in 30 minutes. The police had been combing the city all morning, but they couldn't find any leads. This morning, Jill's colleagues joined the search on social media, writing about the missing girl on Twitter and creating a Facebook group called Help Us Find Jill March. Television and radio immediately reacted to this sad news. Leaflets with information about the missing woman were also posted all over Melbourne. All of this drew widespread public attention from day one, with thousands of people following Jill's fate. Jill's husband gave an emotional speech to reporters, which brought even more attention to the case. Tom, what are you going through? Uh, hell, <laughs> it's just devastating, but, um, yeah, just trying to push on, um, as much as possible. What's, uh, keeping your, what's keeping you going? What's just, uh, hope, just hope somebody sees saw something, or she just walked through the door. Do you still think... That'll, you know, could happen today that you... I have to, I have to, yeah. That same day, police began reviewing street surveillance video and watched hundreds of minutes of footage from various locations in the city of bars and stores, intersections, and gas stations, at first they only had one recording of Jill on camera outside a bar as she said goodbye to friends and headed for home. Meanwhile, a September 24th street search bore fruit. 
Her purse was found in an alley near Jill's house, a find that helped police focus their attention on a particular area, which also bore fruit. On September 25th, Police were able to locate Jill in one of the videos taken on camera outside the bridal store at 1.42 a.m., about 12 minutes after she left the bar. The footage shows her talking to a suspicious man in a blue hoodie in the middle of the street, the same man was filmed near the store four minutes earlier. One of the recordings shows him running in the same direction Jill went. And that CCTV footage, which we've all seen, Lisa, has led police to uh, concentrate uh, much greater on, the, on their suspicion that she may have been abducted. That's right. They're particularly interested in talking to the man in a blue hoodie, jeans and sneakers who was seen doubling back across that CCTV footage. He's described as being in around his 30s, but it is quite good vision there. And police are hoping that anyone who knows him or the man himself will come forward. They say because of this CCTV footage, they're moving more and more towards the likelihood that she was abducted. Police also traced the phone's geolocation and data and determined that it was traveling on one of Melbourne's major highways that night, which means only one thing, the phone was in the car. Law enforcement began to study the camera footage on this highway, thanks to the geolocation data of the phone they did not have to check thousands of cars passing there that night, having in hand the time and traffic pattern of the smartphone, they very soon found that its movements coincide with the route of one of the cars. Police were horrified when they checked the license plate of a car that was registered in the name of a felon convicted of violence against women. On September 27, police announced the arrest of this man, 40-year-old Adrian Ernest Bailey, along with a very nasty charge that investigators believe he brought against Jill Marr by abusing and killing her. This statement shocked the public and journalists, who until the last moment hoped for the best. Despite the fact that the police kept the details secret, no one hoped that Jill could be found alive. At a closed briefing for journalists, the police only reported that the case was solved. Only after some time, all the details will be revealed to the public. As soon as the suspect's name was announced to reporters, his disturbing biography began to be examined under a microscope Adrian Ernest Bailey worked as a pastry chef and had four children by two different women. He married for the first time at the age of 18 when his girlfriend became pregnant, the couple later had a second child, but six years later they divorced. Already at 19, he was behind bars for the first time on charges of abusing a young girl and two attempted assaults on other girls. For this he received five years in prison, of which he served only 22 months and was released on parole. In 1995 he remarried and had two more children, a son and a daughter. In 2000 he was accused of violence again, but the court could not prove his guilt. Two years later, however, he was imprisoned for 11 years for the abuse of five girls. But in 2012, police questioned him for hours until Bailey finally confessed. He killed Jill Marr in an alley on Hop Street, and hours later led investigators to the place where he hid the woman's body, which was on the outskirts of Melbourne near Black Hill Street. According to him, when he spotted Jill outside that bridal store, he tried to kiss her, but the woman punched him in the face, then he dragged her into an alley where he committed all these abominations and killed her. He then began to panic and cry, after which he got in his car and drove to his house, picked up a shovel and returned to the scene, loaded the body into the car and drove to Black Hill Street, where he buried Jill. While he was in custody, the researchers discovered another disturbing fact. At the time of this crime, Bailey was still on parole and his behavior was to be monitored by the appropriate services. The public was outraged that the judicial system allowed such a monster to be released early.
On September 30th, in memory of Jill Marr, organizers of the Passive Road March expected to gather a few hundred people, but the actual number of participants was staggering. That day, 30,000 Melburnians took to the streets, and Jill's parents also took part, thanking everyone for their support and expressing the hope that their daughter's sad fate will force authorities to pay more attention to women's safety on the streets. Jill Marr's funeral was held on October 4th in a private setting, given the tremendous attention to this story, thousands of people could attend the ceremony, and the family wanted to say a quiet goodbye to her. The trial did not begin until April 5, 2013. Initially there were rumors that Bailey would deny his guilt and try to avoid conviction, but at the first hearing he made a full confession. The judge sentenced Bailey to life imprisonment with parole in 35 years at the earliest. By March 2015, three separate investigations resulted in Bailey being found guilty of a number of other violent crimes against three women. He had committed all of these atrocities long before Jill was attacked, but the victims only went to the police after the case became widely publicized. In May 2015, the court sentenced Bailey to an additional 18 years in prison with parole eligibility after 43 years, although his lawyers were able to challenge one of the charges related to the early crimes Bailey would not be able to apply for parole until he was 80 after the trial. Some details of his background emerged the perp revealed that he was abused as a child by adult women and that his father regularly physically punished the boy. His lawyer also stated that he had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which manifested itself in severe mood swings and an inability to control his anger, but none of the above helped him reduce his prison sentence. In November 2020, the unexpected happened, Bailey's own mother gave an interview in which she said that she repeatedly warned the police about her son, but no one listened to her, she tried to convey the message that he was extremely dangerous to society and should not be released from prison, but her words were simply ignored. Well you're a very powerful voice to put to it because you're coming from the other side of it and I was about to say about your son that I thought it was important people know about his history and what he'd done. Because there's the system failed. The system, he shouldn't have been on the streets. And let me tell you, Neil, I went high and I told them that I had concerns. And nobody listened to me. Nobody. His parole officer didn't listen to me. I went into the city to, a, to an office at the justice system, in the justice system. Nobody listened to me. This is before, he, is this before he killed Jill? Yes, it is. You can yes, it is. Nobody listens. We need to listen to these voices. We need to listen to the victims' voices. Just because they're not with us anymore doesn't mean they're less important and their voices shouldn't be heard. After all this history, the state of Victoria tightened the laws related to the parole system. Thanks to these amendments a convicted felon could go back to prison for the slightest misdemeanor, in addition, it became much harder to get out of prison early. This crime showed everyone in Australia how unfair the system can be. Even major politicians have admitted to letting the girl down, but this problem affects the whole world, and in our modern society we still can't talk about justice and security. Take care and thanks for watching.